One man. One hundred guests. One thousand drinks. Drinking with Jason. <laughs> All right, you weirdos, welcome to Drinking with Jason, episode number 10. This week we are featuring the one, the only, the man, the myth, the legend, Jonathan Jans. What's going on, Jonathan? Jason, how we doing, buddy? Great to be here. I'm doing pretty damn good. Uh, <laughs> might as well get right into the drinking part because this is getting kind of funny for me. What are we drinking tonight? Uh, we are drinking some wild, um, unfiltered water. City tap water right here, man. You live dangerously. <laughs> oh, I do. I live on the edge. I wanted to say it's getting funny because this was a show where I drink. Like I, Hunter Shea and I got bombed one night doing this. And, uh, <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> yeah, what a shock. <laughs> and now I've had three guests in a row who don't drink, which is kind of funny for a Drinking with Jason podcast. So Yeah, I'm, we're giving horror a bad name, man. We're totally <laughs> lame. Bunch of losers. I know. So, I will say I may or may not have a little bit of rum in this one, so uh, we shall see. So Jonathan is the author of several novels. What are you on? Eight? Yeah, um, the, uh, eight, eight have been released now, and uh, number nine comes out in um, November, and then two or three next year, so yeah. Wow. Yeah. See, it would help if I actually did research, and then I would know how many novels you have out, but... <laughs> hey man, you hey, hey, correct actually. That I was, was just a good, that was a good one. I was looking at your Amazon page, like uh, eight. So <laughs> nicely work. played, well done. And I have actually read several of your books, which is also rare for the guests I have on here. Um, <laughs> Do you tell them that? Is oh, that, yeah. is that, is that yeah. a common knowledge? Or? Oh yeah, I am such a douche. I don't even hide it. So <laughs> I just ask people on that I find interesting, or if I have read some of their stuff. So. Sure. I'm looking here, and well, first I wanted to say, was your first book The Sorrows? Is that it right? was indeed, yeah, that's right. And that's the one that Brian Keene got a hard on for, right? Yeah, I, I'm not sure of the physiological reaction, but uh, <laughs> uh, sure, I'll take credit for that. Uh, yeah, he put that in his top ten of 2012 list, uh, and it was the number it was the number seven book, but it was the first horror novel mentioned, so he called it the best horror novel of 2012. So yeah, that was. Uh, that was exciting. I'm sure it was. And I mentioned that right away because everything I look up here with you, that Brian Keene quote is mentioned. I'm like, oh, he's using that to good effect. Oh, dude, absolutely. I'm getting a lot of mileage out of that. Uh, and, and it's funny. He gave that one um, in an unsolicited manner. And then uh, he included another one. Well, I don't know if you know, Dust Devils was his number five book of, of 2014. So I spread that everywhere. And uh, I don't know how you feel about blurbs, if you want to go into this or talk about it at all. But okay. I, I, I am horrible when it comes to asking for blurbs. I, I, I have several hang-ups, several reasons why I just never do. Almost never. I think I've asked for a total of three blurbs in my life. And it's, you know, you, you mentioned Brian Keene. Uh, I finally, I've known him for a good while now, but I finally did ask him last week. And then, and then he gave me the best blurb I've ever had. Uh, but is, you know, it took me so long to work up the nerve to ask him. Uh, and it wasn't in that case, it wasn't the fear of rejection. It was mainly because I felt, I, I didn't want to feel like I was, I didn't want him to feel like I was using him. I didn't want it to feel like I, I was being mercenary or acting like he was utilitarian. I mean, I know none of those things are true. That I'm not saying that other authors are that way when they ask for blurbs. It's just I feel that way, and I sure. just had this big problem with it. Huh. No, I'm with you. I um, I think I've only ever asked for two, and they were from the same guy. I just don't ask. I don't. I don't know if they help sales or not. I just never bother so what what prevents you is it just like apathy or <laughs> yeah laziness drunk don't give a shit <laughs> Take <Rum. a> <laughs> and or all of the above yeah the only one i think i've ever gotten was from jack wilder from uh have you ever heard of jacinda wilder no humongous ludicrously humongous romance okay writer. she and her husband write the books together when i say okay. humongous like if you were to look them up on goodreads i bet they have 150,000, 200,000 ratings, like some astronomical number. So I've gotten blurbs from him because I know right. him. 
but it doesn't do him any good. He's writes freaking romance. <laughs> <laughs> kind of off menu for horror. Yeah, I just I saw I one know. for somebody who'd written. Didn't somebody write like something called The Missionary or something? Uh, Jack Wilde. Yeah, yeah, he wrote The Missionary. There yeah. we go. Okay, so I saw that blurb. I researched you, man, oh. uh, and, I, and I saw that blurb on there, and that you know right away, it made me uh, you know buy your entire catalog because of the Jack Wilder blurb. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> you, I, I did got, buy a couple of your books, but it wasn't because of Jack Wow. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, your check is in the mail. Uh, I will say, I'm trying to think of what I've read of yours now. I'm trying to look back over Amazon here. I read, I, I had trouble remembering titles because I'm not that smart, but I read uh, Sorrows, which I loved. Um, I really liked that. And I read uh, Dust Devils. I've read Exorcist Road, Old Order, and Savage Species. So I've read a lot of your shit, actually. I was going to say, that's quite a bit. Yeah, I wanted to talk to you about Old Order, first and <laughs> foremost, which is just a short story. And I loved it because I love horror short stories. And yeah. <laughs> I think I told you this. What sold it for me were the reviews, all these pissed off like people who wanted to read Amish fiction. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming you've read those. Oh my goodness, that I'm telling you, it's it is one of the biggest like inside jokes with 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 some of my friends. Uh, one of my pre-readers, my oldest pre-reader, not not you know chronologically, physically the oldest, but the guy that's been doing it the longest. He he finds it just endlessly entertaining, and he he'll every once in a while, like in a public place, you know, he'll he'll, he'll like in Goodreads, he'll mention. You know, this is, you know, unless you are a fan of Amish uh, romance, you'll like Jonathan Jam. <laughs> Jam. <laughs> because it's, there, was, there was so much just outrage at, those, at that book from, from a very specific demographic that clearly did not read the blurb or the description of the book. Right. You know, and I, I'm not being it's condescending. very clear. Anymore. Yeah, it, it is. It is. I mean, and, and like the, one of the first lines is pretends to be Amish. <laughs> and then, and then, right and then it goes into the fact that he's a thief and he has a terrible comeuppance on the way i mean nobody who reads that description could possibly think they're in for some sweet story where you know with butter churns and well it, if i recall correctly right from the beginning it's clear that he's a scamming right yeah like he's walking down the road right right absolutely yeah, yeah. you I think mean, you'd read that and be like oh wait a minute this is not what I thought it was. <laughs> and that's it. I mean, the, the stuff that outraged them, this is, this is the curious part. I mean, there are a lot of things that we could, you know, make a psychological study of with this, but the, the offensive parts don't really start to happen until, you know, 15, 20 pages in. And there are a lot of no, you know, signs early on that, that say, that make it, that advertise plainly that this guy is a heel. He's got designs on, you know, maybe the women of the house. You know, it's 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 very clearly not what they thought it was. It makes me wonder why they kept going, right? And, and I think that <laughs> from the review, it seems like they got to the end, which yeah. is, of course, the most terrific part. That was one of the ones that made me laugh. Somebody was talking about how absolutely disgusting, like the end of the book was. I'm like, you read right. that far, thinking you were reading an Amish tale? Yeah, I mean, but <laughs> didn't some of the earlier scenes give when he's spying on the woman in the in the lean to in the barn? Didn't that give you some idea that this is not, you know, a oh. normal story about the Amish? So the funny thing is that those reviews totally sold me on the book because they were like, this is. <laughs> This is disgusting. This is filth. I was like, I have to buy this. So, <laughs> they might not be working against you as much as you thought. <laughs> well, that's good. Hey, and the funny thing is that was really the first thing. I mean, it was just a novella, but it was the first thing once I got serious about writing that I got published. And, you know, in like the, out of the first 10 reviews, at least half were one star angry, furious reviews. And I did. I was so worried. I, I, I had this like mini emotional meltdown. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is the reaction. You know, I'm, I, I, maybe I shouldn't be around. I mean, I had all the, this big, this big silly crisis. You know, my wife was the only one who, who saw it, my children. But, uh, but yeah, there was a lot of venom about that story. And I think that it, you know, I feel like with somebody like you who can see the humor in that and likes horror, you know, you'd be sold by that. 
but it was weird. It was like that story got, it, it really spiked, uh, had great sales for a tiny bit, but then it was just buried forever, right? You look at the, the numbers on, on Amazon and they were just, just non-existent. So there's a long time that nobody read that story at all. And it's starting, I think, to make a comeback now uh, because people have read my other work and start to read that. You think it was because the star rating was so low people didn't even want to try it? Seriously. I mean, you know, that sounds, you know, that sounds like I'm making a martyr of myself, but I, I, I wondered that because no, it that had, can totally happen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so that's a real thing, right? Oh, for sure. I mean, yeah. Okay. I've passed up books. I'm like, oh, that only has three stars. I'm not even going to read the description. So you're, you're the problem. You're the, you're the, <laughs> I'm the guy who won't buy books that <laughs> Amish lovers hate. <laughs> I wonder how do they even find it? Are they going into Amazon and typing in old order? Like I can't imagine I can't imagine an Amish fiction that's in the first page. Right? Okay, now that's a good that's a good question. Now there was a time when I think Amish was a tag um, for that book. And I actually talked to my publisher, this really nice guy in, in San Francisco, Untreed Reads, and, and I talked about it. I'm like, hey, you know, I I, I really don't want that tag on there because it, I mean, it, it relates loosely to the Amish, I suppose. It connects because he's pretending to be Amish, but that's it, right? And uh, it, it was almost, and to me, there's nothing, there, there's absolutely nothing offensive toward the Amish in the story, right? No. And there's nothing that is derogatory toward toward that toward that religion, toward those people. But but man, people who, who read that were just just furious just outraged yeah see you're you're a nicer guy than me obviously because had i read all those reviews i'd have written another short story that was like old order Two, fuck the amish or something like that just to really play off <laughs> people uh, you know i you're like a lot of my friends i, I think that uh i think that several people would have would have done something like that yeah <laughs> I was I was too busy questioning you know my own worth as an author to do that to have that reaction. Yeah, old order too. How the hell are you Amish people reading an ebook? <laughs> <laughs> That's a question that never occurred to me. <laughs> I just thought those were hilarious. <laughs> yeah, uh, they were. They were classic. Was, now they're hilarious. It? At the time, very, 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 you know, detrimental oh. to their mental health. Now hilarious. Yeah. Anytime you read bad reviews, they suck, let alone when it's your first book and five of the first 10 are terrible. That's that sucks. How do you feel about that when you get a bad review just out of curiosity? Um, I usually laugh, but I've got thousands of reviews now, so it's you know, it's not the same for me. But when I first started, I you know, those are biting. My first review on Amazon for my first book was a two star, and it basically just shit all over me. And, uh, I, you know, that sucks. That sucks bad. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> now I, now I don't even, I don't even read my reviews anymore. So it makes it better because, you know, I, I could read 25 stars and then you read one, one star and you feel like dirt. So, right. Yeah. I think so that's I just, probably wise. Yeah. Like yeah, when I, I release have, a book, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, well, I was gonna, no, you go ahead. My, mine is fair, pretty uninteresting. What are you going to say? Oh, so I was just going to say, when I release a book, I'll read the first maybe 20 or 30 just to make sure it doesn't totally suck. Right. And then if people seem to like it, then I just stop. So Okay. Yeah. Um, I have a, uh, a, a romance writer friend I met through Sam Hain, you know, my primary publisher. And uh, she, that was, her advice was just to not read reviews. And I think it's it's sound advice. I think it's the best thing. She She avoids, she says she avoids positive and negative reviews. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the positive reviews are nice, but maybe it's worth it to avoid the negative, you know, to avoid that, that destructive criticism. There is constructive criticism, of course. Not every negative review is, is just horrible and vicious and cruel, but uh, that destructive criticism isn't fun. I'd like to say that, it, that I don't care, but, um, you know, may, uh, maybe my skin will thicken with time. Hasn't yet, though. Hasn't with age. I actually have probably thinner skin than, than when I was younger. Uh, I just care more really? uh, about everything. That's interesting. Yeah. Oh. Wow, you're getting nicer and I'm getting meaner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally different trajectories. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, I stopped first with Goodreads because, man, people on Goodreads are vicious. So. They can be. I haven't read a review on there in two years, probably. Really? Yeah. 
Uh, you're you're um, wiser than I am. I'm not, I'm not there yet. I need to get there. I'm not playing with that stuff. And I'm not particularly sensitive, but damn, some of those people. Because some of them are, you know, they're smart people. They just don't like your voice or whatever. And they can get right to the base of your writing and just shit on it. And you can read it and be like, well, they actually have some good points. Maybe I do suck. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need that in my life. Right, right. Um, you just mentioned Sam Hain. Uh, how did you get on with them? Well, uh, probably a, a story similar to the one Hunter told you. Uh, I know you're friends with Hunter Shea, uh, who's yeah, a great... Douchebag. Yeah, total. Uh, hate him. Yeah, uh, but uh, <laughs> Hunter and I both were huge fans of the leisure horror books um, that were around forever. And sure, Don Doria... Horror in the 90s. What's that? They ran horror in the 90s. Yeah, they did. I mean, it was the place, right? You had you had every essentially everybody but but Stephen King and, and Clive Barker and Peter Strauss. But you had, you know, most of the big horror names, Jack Ketchum, Richard Lehman, of course, then in the 2000s, you had Brian Keene and several others. But uh, I I just read a lot of leisure books, and so I wanted to be published with leisure. And and I, I kind of cyber-stalked Don Doria. I would, every time he'd have a podcast, every time he'd have an interview, I would, I'd, I'd Google and, and, and read it and memorize it. And, uh, you know, the restraining order was only marginally effective in preventing uh, my, my cyber stalking. But eventually, uh, when Leisure went under and he ended up at Sam Hain, uh, I wanted to be published with him still just because I valued his opinion and valued his expertise. So I sent something to him the moment I found out he'd gone there. And it was The Sorrows. And he he liked it, so I've been with with him primarily ever since. Uh, I've been doing some things with other people, but mainly mainly with Don at Sam Hain. So the first book you sent to him, he accepted. Yeah, he did. He did. It was actually the second book I had written. Uh, the first one was House of Skin, which ultimately was the second release at Sam Hain. But yeah, The Sorrows was the first one I sent him, and he accepted it. And then he accepted House of Skin once I sent it to him. Wow. The first book you ever wrote is published. That's rare. <laughs> well, yeah, it okay, it is. But there's a lot, you know, that makes it sound better than it make, makes me sound better than I am. You're like a wonderkin. No, I, I, I don't remotely qualify for that. I am, you know, one of my uh, role models. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you have plenty, but one of mine is Abraham Lincoln. I know how much of a cliche that is in the fashion. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I sit around in the stovepipe hat. Uh, <laughs> that was hilarious. That was, sounded so pretentious. I know it didn't mean to be. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I know. I, I, exactly. I'm no. I'm, I'm very pretentious, you know. Uh, and uh, I just love. I, I love what I love about him was that he was such a failure for most of his life. I love that about him. I love the fact that he wasn't. You know, he was. He was a late bloomer in, in a lot of senses. Uh, but he. He was the guy. He said something like, uh, um, "I might not, I might not always be going forward, but I'll never go back." Right? And it was always this. Uh, it reminds me of Roland in the Dark Tower. They always call Stephen King always calls him a plotter uh, with D's rather than T's. Not his writing style, but his you know his, his walking style and thinking style. And I'm a plotter. Uh, it takes me a while to to achieve anything. So even though Sorrows got accepted after I sent it to Don, you know I'd been writing for a while before then and and I had I had written that and tried to do some things with it try to get an agent nothing and uh, actually House of Skin was before that I wrote that book eight times uh, like actually throughout the entire draft and then rewrote it uh, eight different times and Damn. nothing um, and and then I wrote another one that's still in the trunk uh, so after Sorrows and House of Skin weren't published yet I wrote another one so, so really, I had written three by the time I revisited Sorrows, and then you know I reworked that, and then I sent it to Don, and then he accepted it. So it makes it sound really a lot faster and more glamorous than it is, so because it's a several he, year uh, process. It really yeah. was, yeah. Okay. I, I failed so much, so often before I had any modicum of success. So yeah, gotcha. I understand. <laughs> I was gonna say to get your favorite editor to accept your first book. I mean, I feel like my head would be huge. So. Yeah, I, I dealt with way too much rejection to ever, ever, ever have a big head. 
that that's I think that's the le that's the the least likely affliction uh, to to occur in me. I just don't think that's ever going to be an issue. I, I can't even you know people talk about wallpapering their walls with rejection letters. I Matt mean, could have done my neighborhood uh, with rejection letters from from agents, mainly agents. Uh, oh wow! <laughs> yeah, because I always I, I always wanted to go that route, and it, everybody goes a different direction. There's not one that's right or wrong, but that's just the one that I wanted to do, and so I just you know I became like Houdini. I told my wife one day I feel I feel like you know you know how he used to do the thing where he tends to stomach muscles and people would gut punch him, mm -hmm. and uh, that's how I felt every I, I had to tense my stomach muscles every time I opened my inbox because it would be five rejections, you know, and most of them automated. Uh, sure. Yeah. It's a soul sucking experience that I'm so glad I'd, I've never dealt with. I've never sent anything to an editor or an agent. So. Yeah, I know you've gone a different route, but then, you know, I think that you're having a lot of success with that. And uh, I mean, I was just in researching you uh, and researching Goodreads reviews and Amazon reviews and uh, a lot of the numbers you're, you're doing really, really well. So, I mean, that's, it's I, I don't think that one is one is correct and one is incorrect or yours is correct and mine is horrible. Uh, I just think that there are so many different ways to try to go about it. And obviously the one you've chosen is wise. I'm not just saying that because I'm on your show. I mean, clearly it's working. <laughs> no, it is true. I'm awesome. Yeah, you're, you're pretty incredible. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not some kind of self-publishing advocate. I'm an author advocate and whatever. However, people can make the most money from their writing. I don't care how it is. Just right do what works for you but a fortunate side effect of what i do is i don't have people telling me no so yeah as I, if the readers tell me no that's a whole other thing that sucks but uh yeah i i don't know i just i never felt like going through that and i just started writing right at the time when i didn't really have to now i <laughs> i did make the mistake of publishing the first thing i wrote because i didn't go through editors or agents so right? yeah, that turd is no longer online. <laughs> oh, you have pulled it. You oh have yeah, pulled I pulled it, it from circulation. I'd love to hear about that. I, I mean, is, is it is this like a, a dirty secret, or do you do you do you talk about this? Oh no, it's yeah, I talk about it all the time. It was um, I actually rewrote it uh, year, almost a year and a half ago. Now it's now my novel Ash, which is now my best best moving book. Yeah, um, that's one that I got actually. Oh yeah, going through and getting all the freebies. I see. <laughs> well, <laughs> <that's right> somewhere, <laughs> I'm, I'm a poor school teacher with three little kids and a wife. <laughs> that's all right. I bought all your ninety-nine centers. So <laughs> <laughs> authors don't have any money. You can't afford to pay for books. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, re I rewrote that and took it offline because okay. after I got a couple novels out, I went back because I wanted to write a sequel to it. And I was rereading it. I was just like, wow, this thing is terrible. So <laughs> I took it down and had to rewrite that one first. But uh, was, it, was, it a, was it a plot issue or mainly just your writing had by that time it improved? <laughs> My writing was terrible. Yeah. Okay. No pacing issues, uh, wordsmith issues, you know, just everything about it sucked. So. Like even things that I thought were funny, rereading them because my writing wasn't good enough. It's like oh, that's not even funny. So ah, uh, yeah, yes, and humor is kind of a big thing in my books. So <laughs> if, yeah, I get that. I get that from the reviews I read. I mean, it sounds like you know horror and humor both. Yeah, you know, I was just thinking about when I started writing books. Uh, what kind of movies do I like? And um, I mean, my favorite author, as cliched as here's my time turn to be pretentious, is Stephen King, who well, uses. He uses no humor like at all in his books, um, but I can't I can't write like that very well. So I just looked at most of my favorite horror movies, and you know, horror and comedy can kind of go together. You know, like e one eases the tension, one builds the tension, and then it's like a release valve. So. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, is I tell I tell my students in w w we do a suspense writing unit in my creative writing class, and I tell them that humor is is more important in a, any kind of suspense story including horror than is in other things because you know king king himself you know ironically given what you said earlier king himself said that if you don't give that people have a physiological you know need to laugh and mm -hmm. that if you if you don't offer that opportunity they're going to laugh when you don't want them to uh you so know true. and 
and I think I, you know, you're talking about horror and film. You know, I, I would imagine you probably you're probably a fan of things like uh, you know Zombieland, Shaun of the Dead. Uh, I don't know if you like Tucker and Dale versus Evil. Oh yeah, that movie's hilarious. I, I love that movie. I love that movie. Yeah, I got my wife great. to watch it, and she 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 tolerated it. She thought it was pretty cute. I I, I love that movie, man. It's so good. It was an unexpected surprise. I think I caught it on Netflix or yeah. Amazon Prime or something. I was like, Tucker, Dale versus Evil. What? And then like 10 minutes in, I'm like, oh, this is this is my kind of movie right here. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. so good. It has such a good heart too, right? I mean, it's it's hilarious, but it's all, it's all, I just, I love the movie. I, I thought it was fantastic. Sure. No, I, I, I love stuff like that. Like American Werewolf in London even. It might oh. be one of the best examples of horror and comedy, right? Amazing. So, Amazing. He's going through that incredible werewolf transformation. And then right in the middle of it, cracks a joke about calling his friend Meatloaf. So... <laughs> You know, it's just, it's great. So, oh, it's fantastic. You know. um, and I also wanted to bring up something else here. I just read Dust Devils. Man, I'm so bad okay. with titles. I'm like, what the hell did I just read? That's Dust fair. Devils, which is a super violent book. Well, you know what? well done. <laughs> well, thank you. It's so funny that, you know, I think, I don't know if I read that you had said that at some point or, because, I mean, many, many, many people have remarked on that. And in fact, the, that's the only, I'm not saying that there aren't other things to criticize, but really if, if, if there has, because it's been well received, but if there is a criticism that pops up again and again, it is that. And I'm not saying you're criticizing, I mean, you might hate it or whatever, but it, it, was, it was a pretty shitty book. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's pretty, pretty. I, no, I really like that book. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I just, when I wrote it, I did, it didn't seem violent at all to me. Which sounds really? like I'm that ball, a, ballroom, uh, ballroom, bro, Jesus Christ, ballroom <laughs> brawl. I need some more rum. Yeah, ballroom brawl. That didn't seem violent. I mean, it, looking back, it does. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, objectively speaking, it is violent. You know, it's it's just that when I submitted it to Don, like to me, it was this really. It was about fathers and sons. It was like this, this heartfelt <laughs> <laughs> rumination on, on, on reconciliation with, 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 with his father and then trying to be a father figure to this boy who had lost his. And to me, that's what the book was about. And, and I mean, I, I still think it is, but I, I think I was so, you know, that's the part I cared so much about or thought so much about, or maybe it was the most personal to me, that I didn't even think that much about how it, it is extraordinarily violent. Right, that 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 whole scene in the bar room, it it, it takes uh, from dusk till dawn and near dark. It takes ah, the near dark. Yeah, I mean, it takes that kind of bloodshed, and and then it and then it, it multiplies it, you know, a hundredfold. It, I mean, you've got just all sort, you know, headshots and you know geysers of 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 blood going everywhere. Uh, you know, the the main character sacrificing a man, you know, by ripping open his belly with a with a bottle, you know, with a broken bottle. I mean, and that's just the beginning. It's a it's a, it's a spectacularly violent scene. Um, yeah, it's pretty it, just, it just didn't occur. Yeah, well, thanks. It just didn't occur to me. I didn't think. I just didn't. I just didn't think about the violence, but yeah, it really. You're. It is. It is. Well, so and I'll get to my point here, probably about the time we end the podcast. But uh, I liked that. I, I think vampire fiction has really sucked like the last <laughs> ten years. It's been really? awful. Yeah. So I liked this, and the first thing I thought of, I might even. I think I wrote a review for it on Amazon. I think I might have even mentioned Near Dark. That is exactly what that felt like to me. Was, oh wow! Uh, Good, like an homage to Near Dark in the West, um, and that's why I love that because it was the ferocity that I love and expect, but almost never get in a vampire tale. Well, so, that's 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 one of the best things you could say about it. Uh, that makes yeah, Near Dark. You know, Eric Red is a is a fellow horror author with with you and me, and he's a, he's a Sam Hain horror author who's with whom I've been in contact. He's just I just name dropped. I didn't okay. intend to, but I just name dropped. Uh, <laughs> I I like Abe Lincoln, and I know Eric Red. Right? <laughs> Dude, I'm so full of myself tonight. Uh, no, but I he wrote the screenplay for Near Dark, and uh, it, I just I I didn't even know that at the time that I watched Near Dark. I, I love that story. I love Bill Paxton's character when he that scene in the bar. Oh when yeah, he's, when he's just coming daring in. them to do something. 
Yeah. I mean, yeah. he is just so, the, the, I think you used the word ferocity. He's so ferocious, so savage. And, and I, think, I think that that's how vampires should be. I, I, it, it, maybe it's just personal taste, right? But I don't like, personally, the lovelorn you know, and aside from aside from Twilight, which is which is probably what most people would say this is the most egregious example of the you know the the, the lovey dovey vampire thing. Aside from that, which I've never read or seen, so I honestly can't speak you know about it. But I just I've read several vampire books where you know the it, it's 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 that tragic figure and and it's more about love and 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 I and that love is important. But I just I don't like it with my vampires, you know. I don't I don't want it in my vampire story. I want my vampires to be scary. I want them to be like in Salem's Lot. They were scary, right? Sure. Uh, and when and when they went they go after Susan, uh, Ben Ben Mears's girlfriend in Salem's Lot. You know they didn't want to. It wasn't you know it wasn't to court her. It, it was it was it was cruel and vicious and to turn her into something bestial. And, and that's why it was scary. So I think a vampire story should be scary. The vampires should be imposing uh, and diabolical. So uh, maybe it's just personal taste, but I think you and I feel very similarly about, about what vampires should be. We're totally simpatico. I, the way I see it, if you're, wow, we're really nerding out on plot ideas and stuff here, but the themes, I love it. I love um, it. if you're, if you're, an immortal and you eat people essentially <laughs> like we're cattle to them right like right, they're exactly. so far beyond us why would they love us and want to you know that's ridiculous so i don't know i find all that to be nuts you know a book that does that really well you just mentioned the cattle thing that i just read recently um i read an f paul wilson book a long time ago called the keep and I loved it. And for some reason, I didn't read another. That was probably when I was 22. I didn't read another F. Paul Wilson book until this year. I'd heard about one called Midnight Mass. Uh, and okay. there's uh, this guy on Goodreads named John Recluse. And he's this really, really, I mean, you can tell people who really know their stuff. He's a guy from whom I get recommendations because he, he never fails me. He told me about Midnight Mass. And then I, I read that. And I'm like, yeah, this, this is exactly how, how vampires would view us they they would view us as we use that i use that word earlier with blurbs that utilitarian mercenary there's no affection there there's no warmth there right they want to they want to rip our jugulars and, and feast and you know f paul wilson really depicted them that way in that book midnight mass huh i'm looking yeah, here. it's I'll great it's fantastic I, I just feel foolish for not reading more of his stuff i've only read two of his books uh, I haven't read any Repairman Jack. I have a couple, but everybody talks about Repairman Jack. I've not read any. I need to. You know, I'm not sure I've ever read one of his, and everyone always tells me I need to. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. My freaking TBR list is so out of control. I don't know when the hell I'll ever get to some of the books I want to read. Um, Anything coming up on it that you're uh, exp especially excited about? Uh, you know, I haven't read Stephen King's Doctor Sleep yet, which hurts my soul. Me and either, and I have an equally injured soul for not having read it. Yeah, King is my favorite, by the way. I don't know if I said that earlier. He is by far my favorite. Yeah, he's incredible. It, that guy. <laughs> I have no words for that guy. No, uh, no, there are no words. I mean, it, it, is, it is obscene how good he is. Yeah, and you know, the thing is, I get this in review sometimes when I used to read them. Um, people would always say, oh, well, this is like Stephen King's story, such and such. Like, first of all, the guy has written a million stories he's covered everything yeah there's no topic i can touch that he's yeah. not already mastered so right. just put him aside and then yeah. <laughs> ignore him yeah um, and no, i have not read uh, his mr mercedes i think it was called oh you read that i have not read that yet and oh, I really that, want to. today that won the um edgar award for best mystery novel in the nation oh, uh shit which is just awesome. I just saw that popped up on my Facebook feed and, and made me grin from ear to ear because he is, I, 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 I don't think that he can be praised enough. I don't think that he can be appreciated enough. And he's just so diverse. You know, Mr. Mercedes, I read. Prior to that, I read Joyland. Have you read Joyland? Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. I Great mean, that story. Thing, oh, my goodness. That thing, I felt like I had lived in that place in that time period. That was phenomenal. 
amazing, like Ray Bradbury level was good. I mean, that that yeah. it was. It was phenomenal, and after it finished, I was telling my wife how good it was, and she was asking what it was about, and I started describing it. I'm like, wait a minute. Not a whole hell of a lot actually happened in that no. book. No? I was just enthralled the whole yeah. time. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, when, when you and I talk about a guy dressing up in a dog costume, when you and I talk about, you know, uh, you know th this this – you know, re relationship with this, with this kid who has a medical condition, it doesn't, if I try to explain it to my wife, it wouldn't sound fascinating at all, but in the hands of King, you know, in the hands of that, that gift that he has in that craft, it's just, it's riveting. He'll spend three pages describing it, which in one hand drives me crazy because I want to get yeah. to the story. And in the other hand, I still read it all. Cause I'm like, wow, this is, yeah. Can you hear that? Is that your dog? Yeah. One of my little yip dogs. You're a dog man. Good. Well, how many dogs do you have? What kind? All that jazz. Two miniature schnauzers. Nice. Yeah. Well played. Well done. Yeah. I'm uh, actually allergic to dogs, so they're oh. hypoallergenic. <laughs> oh, you're like, so seriously? <laughs> yeah, so I can live with them. Yeah, they have hair instead of fur, and they don't shed and all that. So Interesting. Are, are we have a, um, a mini or medium-sized golden doodle or something. I, I've always had mutts, whether they're cats or dogs. I've always had strays. And my wife fell in love with this kind of dog that she had heard about. So for the first time, we paid for an animal. And we got this dog named Weasley, who's named after the Weasley family and Harry Potter. But he, he also, I, I bring him up because he is also non-shedding. So if you ever visit, you can, you can come here free of sneezing and eye-watering. All right. And we can geek out about Stephen King. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, what kind of dog was it? Um, like a either a mini miniature or medium sized golden doodle. I mean, she's gonna tell me that I'm wrong when she watches this. Okay. I think that's what she calls him. I just I just know he's he's nice and you know all that stuff. Sure, I've heard about a lot of uh, breeders mixing poodles with other breeds, and like half the time they end up being hypoallergenic or something like that. So is that right? I just can't you imagine? I mean, maybe I, I, you don't want to imagine that conception, right? With the <laughs> poodle and then and then the Whatever is it a golden retriever? Seriously, like what? What must that be like? Yeah, and I'm too manly to have anything with poodle in it. That's just gross. Can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. In talking about it, I, I do feel a little compromised. So, <laughs> understandable. Uh, before my brain gets completely off track, which it already has, what I was saying about dust devils. Is I'm sorry, I keep interrupting you. Jeez, no, it's ahead. it's not you. It's the rum. I'm like okay. Jack Sparrow. <laughs> uh, I'm reading this and I had seen you on the Monster Men podcast and I'd, I'm i pretty sure it was on there where you, I'd heard a hunter or someone say that you don't swear and it's right around the time I'm reading this I'm like what? This dude doesn't swear? He's having people get eviscerated for like 20 pages in a row Just like <laughs> this is like a gourmet book and this dude doesn't swear? <laughs> How? How does yeah. that happen? Well, I tell you, I I, I did uh, swear uh, maybe about a, uh, as much as the average person back when I was in my late teens, early 20s. And uh, I became a teacher when I was 22. And, you know, I'm a very, I mean, I don't, I don't think unhealthily so, but I have, I definitely have some some OCD tendencies. My wife thinks I'm undiagnosed OCD, you know, and you combine that with some paranoia. And I, I'm always afraid of, of hurting people's feelings. And I'm also afraid of saying the wrong thing. And I'm especially okay. afraid, I became very fearful early in my teaching career of blurting out a cuss word on accident. Uh, even though, I mean, it, was, it wasn't like I was Eddie Murphy, you know, raw walking around, you know, <laughs> dropping the F-bomb all the That's time. That's closer to me. Yeah. Is that is that really? Are you like that's great? It's, it's uh, bad. You, it's yeah, you're so runner, bad. You and Hunter, man, you guys are like you park your cars in the same garage. But I, I, <laughs> I was, I, I was kind of average, but I would cuss. Like especially if I was watching a, a game, you know, and my team was getting whooped, I would really unleash a tirade of of profanity. And I just began to fear. Okay, what would happen? Because I was coaching too. Okay, so then you add the sports element. I was a varsity girls basketball coach at age 22. And I didn't know what I was doing, and we were losing all the time. And I, I was afraid I would cuss, and I started to condition myself to not do that because that would kind of help 
take away that paranoia because I, I I'd like wake up in a cold sweat afraid of doing that and making that mistake because you know how unforgiving people can be you know in our society you know that cer certain mistakes just you know are really frowned upon and uh, you know I think being a bad role model or being perceived that way in front of kids I think you could see a parent feeling that way if it if a person used a lot of profanity so so I, I conditioned myself to not do it much and then when I had children uh, and you know there there are people I know who cuss in front of their kids and their kids turn out fine they're, they turn out great but it was just kind of a, a, an amplification of that paranoia so I just felt like the best thing in, just in my private life was to not cut I'm not saying I never do because I still do on occasion if I'm by myself you know if I if I hurt myself I will still cuss uh, you know, if I'm, you know, ultra excited or angry and by myself, I will still utter, but, but mainly it's all on the page now. It's, uh, it's, it's sure. not with me anymore, but it, that, that's how it came about. It wasn't, it wasn't necessarily like a, a moral choice where I, I certainly don't look down upon most of my friends cuss like sailors. So it's not like I look down upon them. Yeah. Okay. I was just curious. Like I said, I'm, I'm reading your books. I was reading Exorcist Road and crazy shit happens in that. Oh, that demon! Isn't that demon foul-mouthed? That's disgusting. Yeah, there's. I'm reading this like I don't write shit like this. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I just wanted to get the story on how yeah. that came about. Okay, I figured it might have something to do with the teaching or something like that. So. Yeah, the teaching and parenting. And I'm gonna. By the way, you mentioned Exorcist Road. I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna do a sequel to that pretty soon here. Yeah, it's gonna come sometime. I'm gonna write that in the next few months, I believe. No okay. kidding. Anyway. Uh, how long have you been releasing books? I mean, you've got quite a few, um, particularly considering, like you said, you're a teacher. That's got to be a lot of time on your hands. Yeah, it, I don't, I don't, uh, and I don't say this in a self-aggrandizing, like puffing my chest out way, but I really and don't. Can... <laughs> Still I, uh, I don't sleep a whole lot. I wish I could because I get really. I just get really dead by 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 nightfall. At least you know emotionally, I'm just so drained. So a lot of my writing comes, a lot of my writing comes late at night, and then in the summers. Now, okay, so I write about three three big things a year. So it's either two novels and a novella, or three novels, and one and a half will be during the summer, where okay. I just you know write like crazy. I just write like a fiend during the summer, um, probably. I mean, you might write more than I, I know. Brian Keene talked about, I forget what he said. It was insane. I think it was something like 20,000 words in one day. Oh, no. Which that's, is, that's, that, they'd, have to, they'd have to suck. Like, what? You wrote I, I don't, I don't know how they can. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, he's, you know, I mean, Brian is fantastic. So I, I don't know how he, I don't know how he can get that many out. And that's not a normal day for him. But it was some round number that was just, to me, dizzying. I couldn't believe that he'd written that many. Um, I was just shocked. For me, uh, a normal output during the summer will be 3,500 to 4,000 words. Um, but, you know, that accumulates pretty that, fast. That's a lot of writing, sure. Yeah, it is. So, I mean, that, that, that starts to add up really quickly. And so I usually get a novel and a half done, which leaves, you know, just another, another novel and a half for the other uh, however many months, you know, uh, that, that we have. So, you know, I, that, that's kind of how it gets done. So I write on the weekends some, at late at night some, and then there's that big burst during the summer. And through all those things, I managed to, to, to put out three no novels or two novels in a novella a year. Okay, gotcha. And are you doing most of them through Sam Hain now? So yeah, um, I have uh, I've been trying to do two through Sam Hain per year, and then one for something else. So there was a superhero novel I did for Kindle Worlds uh, one year. Um, oh, I saw that uh, Bloodshot. Was that it? Yeah, 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 yeah. I wanted to ask about that. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, and uh, so that was fun. This past summer, I wrote a young adult novel, horror novel, but a young adult novel, and my uh, my. You see, there's no way to say ate my agent without sounding like a total tool, right? It's like, <laughs> oh, my, you know, my agent, you know. But because yeah. I, I know, because I, I cringe when other writers say that. It's like, shut up. Where's you know? my pipe? Yeah, you, <laughs> yeah, you put your smoking jacket on and, you know, fold your <laughs> leg, smoke your pipe, you, you, you fool. Uh, but anyway, she has it right now. And uh, is, is she, she, she revised it, she and her team, and sent it back to me. Really, really like 
you talk about evisceration, man. I mean, it was it was humbling. I mean, she Ooh. she's very honest, but uh, she found a lot that needed improved, and she was right. So I, I I worked on that, sent it back to her, and then we're trying to decide whether it's it's the right fit for for a Sam Hain novel or for other markets. So um, you know, I'd I'd be delighted if it was published by Sam Hain, but uh, it might be there, it might be somewhere else. But we just have to figure out what the right fit is. But first, she wants to make it the best it can be. So that was last summer. This summer is going to be uh, another another project. But but yeah, that's that's kind of how I've been approaching it. Okay. No, that makes sense. I uh, want to hear about your stuff too, though. By the way, uh, I mean, how, how many how many do you do in a year? It, it varies. I burn myself out, so I'll write six thousand words a day for a couple weeks and just that's a lot. I'll crush. Like I wrote a book in like 18 days once and then, but then I'm, I'm so exhausted afterwards. I won't write for like six weeks and then I get a wild hair up my ass and I'll write another novel in six weeks. And then I take a month off. So if I could maintain that pace, I would be <laughs> super rich, but I can't. So, uh, and I'm coming out of one of those lulls. Now I've got this series, which is just crushing for me and, I still have to get the third book out. So it's just, you know, ups and downs. It doesn't help that I'm at home by myself all day. So I'm like, eh, what's on Netflix? Let's, <laughs> let's take That's a, a blessing and a curse. Yeah, right? uh, it is. It is. There's something almost like lycanthropic about the way you do it because it's like you go through these lulls where you're not the werewolf and then you just you get after it, man, and you rip and tear and, and produce produce your work and then you and then you go dormant a little bit. You know, it's 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 kind of an interesting it's 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 kinda of cool. Probably frustrating for you when you're in a lull, right? You probably get sure annoyed with yourself. It's super frustrating. Yeah. yeah. I sit down, I'm like, I don't want to write today. I'm like, but I gotta get like something out. Right. Like, yeah, my process makes absolutely no sense, and I would never recommend it to anybody, ever. But uh, you know, I've got time. So, like I said, I don't, I don't have another job. So, you know, if I only write two thousand words a day or a thousand words a day, if I do that every day, I'm still doing better than than most people. You know, who are doing jobs and have kids, and you know, that's that's tough stuff. I don't have any of that. So, I'm just a lazy ass. <laughs> That's the only excuse I have. You were living the life, man. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm doing okay. I'm doing all right for myself. So, uh, well, when you get to that that third book in the series, like, how long was is that going to take you? Um, I've got a lot of it in my head now, and I've I've already been writing it a while. So, once I really start hammering on it, hopefully next week. Okay. Uh, two months to release. Okay. I've kind of got my writing down where I only do two drafts now. Okay. Um, and then a very, very light third draft uh, editor, a couple proofreaders, a couple beta readers, and I crack the whip on them. Even though I, I dick around for four months, I give them like a week. <laughs> I love that. I love the hypocrisy. Total <laughs> yeah. level standard. Yep. And I even send it in the email. I'm like, sorry, but I need this in three days. You know? <laughs> <laughs> So, I like that. You're like a di dictator in a way. Wonderful. Total ass. I feel bad for everyone around me. What? Uh, <laughs> who, who, does, who does your covers, which are really cool, by the way? Who does those? Her name is Renee Folsom. She's actually another author. Okay. Um, she does. She doesn't do too many covers now. Um, she's kind of just works with the clients she has, but um, sometimes she'll take on new people. But yeah, she does all of my stuff now. So yeah. she does a killer job. He really does. I mean, they're really, really professional. It looks, it looks like you know, NYT bestseller, man. I mean, it looks really good. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with it. I've got a, a couple on the wall there. Usually, most people can't see them, but uh, I, was, I, I thought that they were, but I didn't want to sound foolish. So uh, yeah, yeah, it, yeah, I can see them. I, I really try to get her to work on my branding because I want, if you see one of my books, I want you to know that it's a Jason Brandt book. Right. So even if it's a different series. I want my name on it the exact same way. I want um, certain colors or we always laugh because I always end up saying, ah, I put some flames on here somewhere. <laughs> so it looks like one of my books, so, <laughs> but uh, you know, it seems to work pretty good. So yeah. I can't complain. Uh, I wanted to ask about this bloodshot Kindle worlds thing. I have been thinking about writing for Kindle worlds for yeah. months. How, 
how was that? Was it cool? Yeah. It? Yeah, it was really cool. Uh, it was fun. It, I, I, I was vaguely familiar with Bloodshot, the character, from back in college. I, ha I wasn't like a hardcore comic reader, but I was aware of Bloodshot and liked what I knew. I always thought it was kind of a Terminator-esque character. You know, it's, I mean, it's not a cyborg, strictly speaking, I mean, in, in the traditional way, but there's definitely that man and machine meld together. And, okay. and I really liked that. And I also, as I started to read through, because there were several, it was in the world of Valiant Comics. That's one of the Kindle worlds. And, um, you know, they had Harbinger, they had Man of War, they had a few others. And, and uh, Bloodshot was the one that seemed the, the coolest to me, spoke to me the most. So I went and started reading a bunch of comics. And uh, they, uh, they, they really spoke to me. There, there was a subplot with vampires. In one, really? which you know, you know, they were yeah, and, is, and most of most of Bloodshot had nothing to do with vampires. But there's this really cool L Lucy Wistenra from you know that's a that's a character name that's Mina Murray's best friend in in the original Dracula. So there was like this really strong link to Dracula, and then mm -hmm. of course that appealed to me in my horror mind. So I began to think, okay, how can I make this a Bloodshot novel? But how can I try to really you know work on these this vampire angle and make it fit and it really came together at least in my opinion it came together well so bloodshot and essentially does va uh does battle with mobsters and vampires these two different factions of evil in new york city and uh it was a blast to write there's this the opening scene there's this big set piece at the guggenheim museum which i'd never I'd, I'd heard of the Guggenheim on Seinfeld, but I didn't know the layout of it. So like the, it's, it's a spiral, it spirals up and up and up and up and it just lent itself to action. Uh, it was so fun to write, man. I would love to do another superhero novel of some kind because sure. it was just so fun to write. I mean, you, action, you know, action obviously is part of horror too, but it's, it's, it, it can be a really enjoyable thing to try to choreograph and describe so it was cool i was really fortunate to be able to do it hmm that's that's really interesting i've i saw uh gi joe is on there and as a kid yeah i was like a gi joe nut were you really so, oh my god it was ridiculous so i was looking through thinking i'm gonna write a gi joe story and it's gonna be a badass gi joe story <laughs> yeah and then i saw you can't use the sergeant slaughter character really like, can't do it yeah i guess he owns the rights to his image or name or whatever because he was a pro wrestler ah uh, right um so i was like i can't write a gi joe story without Slar sergeant slaughter just beating <laughs> shit out <of> everybody <laughs> so then you uh, that yeah. ended the dream yep totally canned it man and it was that and uh you ever read any blake crouch dude I, okay I, blake crouch is one of those names blake crouch uh uh jake uh, Conrath, uh, J.A. Conrath, and, yeah, J.A. Conrath, and um, Nick Cutter are three mm -hmm. names that I, I keep hearing over and over again that I need to read. Uh, Blake Crouch is just killing everything, I guess. But yeah, has that show coming out? Wayward, Wayward Pines, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I need, I need to. So you're, you're a fan? Oh, he's, he's probably my second favorite writer now. He's just, wow. yeah, he's incredible. And his Wayward Pines series is in Kindle Worlds. And okay. I, was, I just keep thinking, man, I'd love to write a story in there, but yeah, I just wasn't sure how that process went or anything. How involved, like is Amazon even involved in anything? Or you just basically send them a story and they take care of the rest. Yeah. Um, this was a little different and I'm, I'm going to sound like the pretentious, you know, idiot again, uh, the way, <laughs> the way that it, I, I, cause I hate, you know, cause it's, I, I'm not one of those authors who, who, who will be dismissive of any of any kind of you know of, of template, right? I mean, there are so many ways to, to to go about it, and you know the agent is just one way, and there's so many people far more successful than I am, you know, who, who who's never who's never even considered having agents. So I just I feel like a tool when I mention my agent, like because it makes me sound like I think I'm one of those guys, like it's some sort of badge of honor. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Man. Okay, I mean, I because I, I, I love her and I'm thankful for her, but but you know, I I recognize that that's that doesn't mean that I've made it. Okay, so anyway, the, um, when they launched Kindle Worlds, uh, they approached agents to um, see if any of their authors would be interested in helping the the line get off the ground, right? Okay. So they, so they commissioned uh, 
certain authors through certain agents. And, you know, Louise Fury is, is my agent and she was one that they approached. And so she asked me since I was one of her clients. And of course, the, you know, the money was really good. I'm not going to lie. That was that was a big part of it for me. <laughs> You're like, who the hell's bloodshot? Oh, the check. <laughs> sure. Okay. The, uh, ophthalmologist? What? what? Uh, <laughs> No, I I knew, yeah, I I knew the pay was good, and 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 you know I did have a little experience with bloodshot, so uh, I just uh, that that's how I got in on that, and and the, like I said, the pay was good. It was just a uniformly awesome experience. All right, before I let you go here, uh, two more quick questions. I've been looking at the Nightmare Girl. I think that's going to be next on my reading list. What is this about? Um. Okay. So the Nightmare Girl is uh it begins with a really horrific situation i mean horrific in in the everyday sense uh there's a uh, uh a man joe crawford he's a family man he has a wife and a little girl and he pulls over to fill up his gas uh in his truck and he across the island uh the the gas station island on the other side of the pump he hears a, a, a another child this is another two-year-old it's a boy wailing uh in his uh, car seat in a van and it's kind of a muggy day and everybody's a little irritable and Joe as he's filling up his tank he notices the mother of that child looking very very uh, much at her wits end and she looks very aggravated with the child and Joe starts to worry and then he hears uh, as he as he turns back to talk to his wife he hears this dull smack and his stomach drops, and he thinks to himself, "Oh, please, this can't be what I think it is." And he turns around, and sure enough, um, she's abusing her child. She's just sitting there, just smacking her little boy as he sits there in his car seat, wailing. And so he intervenes. Uh, and that that scene, by the way, was really, really difficult to write since uh, I just, you know, child. I mean, obviously, that's something we all hate is child abuse, but it was not something that I write about very often. Sure. Um, so that was hard. Anyway, so he intervenes, and eventually the, the the situation escalates. It becomes like this horrible Jerry Springer scene, but but finally the mother and her mother. I mean, the mother is like nineteen, and the the grandmother is like thirty nine. They mm. those two and the child they they pull away, and Joe feels like he's not seen the end of this, and of course he hasn't. So um, the child gets taken away from her. And he, he soon finds out that she's part of this really monstrous uh, ancient fire cult uh, that originated in Ireland. Um, but these people are into all kinds of just, just, just terrible rites and ceremonies. And uh, they target Joe and his family. And so for doing the right thing, he, he faces some terrible consequences. And, you know, his, his two-year-old becomes a target. His wife becomes a target. He's a target. And uh, it's, it, it's got supernatural overtones. And uh, it's, it's really, it's, it's, a, it's a work that, you, you read reading Joe R. Lansdale? Mm hmm Okay, so he's, if I had to choose my second favorite writer, it'd probably be Lansdale. Ketchum would be right there too, Jack Ketchum. But I love Joe R. Lansdale. And it's, it's, it's largely inspired by, by his style. I mean, it's not like a pastiche or anything. It's not like I'm copying him, but but I kind of channeled him a little bit because it's kind of like a suspense thriller until the end where it gets really horrific. Uh, and uh, Happen Leonard, do you ever read any Happen Leonard books? Uh, the, it's, it's his series. Uh, but the, like the, the, the relationship between Joe and this cop ends up being a little bit like the relationship between Happen Leonard and Joe R. Lansdale's books. So it's kind of an homage to him while being a horror novel, but also a suspense thriller. And it's, uh, it's, it's been really, it's the reception has been really good so far. So I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of it. Definitely one of my, I mean, I don't know if you say so, but you probably have one or two of your favorite of your books that are your favorites, right? Like sure. deep down, you love them the most. The nightmare girl is definitely one of my favorites is one I'm really, really proud of. Oh, all right. It's got a killer cover on it. I absolutely love the look of that thing. Thanks, man. I, I did too. Angela Waters is, is that cover artist. She does a great job. Yeah, I think that's uh, that might get moved up to the top of my TBR. So well, I'd love for you to read it, man. Love to hear what you think. Oh, I definitely will. Uh, and I wanted to ask. You said you have a book coming out in November. What's yeah? That one is uh, called Wolfland, 
And uh, I, it's it's not like I'm taking a tour of all the monsters here, but I you know I wrote a vampire book. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing the same thing, man. I want to okay, hit yeah, I mean, it makes me feel like I, I, it seems like I'm doing that. I'm really not. I'm writing what just like you. I'm writing what what interests me. And uh, in in Wolfland is one that I I love werewolf stories too. You mentioned American Werewolf in London. I love that story. So I wanted to do one as well. And it's kind of like the zombie thing, you know. I. I as a lot of people have done zombies, and I, I love a good zombie story. I've just not written one because I haven't thought of a good one yet. Right? right? There's nothing that you don't want to be a special forces guy wading through hordes of zombies. Then they yeah. find sanctuary, and then sanctuary gets messed up. Yeah, that's special, that's, yeah. I get you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I want I want to find something that that really speaks to me. So uh, I finally found the idea for for Wolfland. Uh, for this book and it's called Wolfland. It's, it's with my editor with Don right now, just sent it in recently, but it's, it's one, I don't know if you ever do this, but I, I occasionally I'll outline like exorcist road. I outlined, I had that thing planned from beginning to end basically. And, and I think it, it worked, but there are other times where I just go and I have no idea where the story's going mm-hmm. and that can be good or bad. In this case, it, it, I thought the story was going to be like 65,000 words it ended up being 170, and then I and then oh. I had to, uh, yeah. There's so much I had to cut, and uh, Shit. yeah, That's it a just big book. turned into a beast, figuratively and literally. And it became. I thought it was going to be like a Richard Lehman book. I thought it was going to be this fun, lighthearted romp with you know this underdog hero who was attracted to the pretty female lead. I really thought it was going to be that, and it turned out to be so different. It is Jason is is by far the darkest thing I've ever written. My pre reader, one of my pre readers, got back to me the other day, and he was like, "This, are you sure you wrote this? Because this is like this is worse. Than Jack Ketchum, this is worse than Brian Smith as far as the depravity of what happens." Damn, he, he couldn't believe it, and I couldn't. I, I still there was a scene I knew I was building up to because um, there's this major subplot that deals with this abuse the serial abuse of this of this 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 woman and uh i knew that i knew what was coming it was a scene involving her but i didn't want to write it i kept putting it off putting it off i'd written everything after it and i kept putting it off because i knew how violent it was going to be and how horrible and and, and, and just nightmare she was going to be it's the darkest thing i've ever written that scene but then throughout there's just so much bloodshed I should have known it. If I were smarter, I would have known it because in this opening scene, like four people get bitten by a werewolf. And so they all four change, but they're all four very different. And I follow their, their, their paths. So, I mean, how are you going to do that in 65,000 words and do it justice, right? The math didn't work out. So I should have known that that was, that, that, that it was going to be a longer novel then, but man, this thing just, it got bigger and bigger and bigger and got darker and darker and darker. And, uh, anyway, that's coming out in November. I'm really proud of it, but I, I feel like I should put a warning for my readers about, you know, just because it makes dust devils. You know, like you said, dust devils is bloody. It's 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 an Amish romance compared to what I've written. <laughs> I was just going to say, you should yeah. just call it Old Order 2. I and should. <laughs> I should. Yeah. I mean, just go ahead and take the blowback, right? <laughs> and I, I just, just go ahead and, and steal myself. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. Did you say what the name was? Uh, Wolfland. Wolfland, and that's how it's going to be released. They're not going to change it on you or anything. Uh, I mean, well, they, they they change them sometimes. I'm not sure if they're gonna. I wanted people to think of Zombieland, sure, because uh, I love that movie. It's fantastic. Uh, it is. So I, I kind of wanted people to think of that. And there's this uh, this. It's not like Stephen King's Funland uh, or Joyland, rather. Richard. Okay, I did want people to think of Stephen King's Joyland and Richard Lehman's Funland because both of those are set in amusement parks, and this one, the last uh, quarter, is an amusement park. So I wanted there to be some sort of connection there. So there. So I, I, I kind of like Wolfland, but we'll see if Don changed because they've changed them before. Savage Species was not the original title that got changed like five times. So it, you know that happens. Okay. okay, cool. And that's November. I'm looking forward yeah. to that. That sounds yep. like my kind of thing. Uh, give us your. Where can people find you? Website, social media. Yeah, uh, that is uh, JonathanJans.com, and. That's that's kind of my home, my blog, and all that stuff where you can find my contact information. I do a fair amount on Facebook. 
Uh, if you friend me under Jonathan Jans, I'll, I'll talk to you there. Uh, Goodreads uh, is a – I love Goodreads. I think you you like that place too. Oh, yeah. Uh, I use Goodreads yeah. a lot. I just don't read my own reviews there. <laughs> no, you're, you're, you're smarter. I, I, I haven't gotten there yet. I, I need to get to where you are because that, that's a wiser, a wiser approach than what I have. It's not like I like – stay up all night reading my reviews and all that stuff. It's just that, you know, somebody will make me aware of one and then I'll go read it. And I know I shouldn't, right? Gotcha. They'll say, oh, dude, you just, you got taken apart, you know? And, and sometimes it's good, right? I just read a really good review and then, then I'm excited. Then I rush over there and break my fingers touching the keyboard. But, you know, when it's a bad review, I still, I'm just too curious to not look when somebody brings that to my attention. So anyway, Goodreads, I'm on there as Jonathan Jans, of course. Twitter, at Jonathan Jans. You can follow me there, and I'll you know probably follow you back. Uh, so anyway, those are probably the four main places to find me. All right, man. Sounds good. Appreciate you coming on. Uh, you were awesome. It was a good Jason time. Jason and I, I had a great time, man. I'm sorry I didn't drink, drink, drink the rum like you did. Maybe one of these days I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll get masculine enough to do that. I thought drinking with Jason, having authors on, this is a home run. Three yeah. of you in a row. <laughs> no brainer, right? <laughs> yeah. gonna drink like a like, like a bunch of a bunch of fish, but look at us. Yeah. Bunch of losers. <laughs> All right. On that note, man, I appreciate it. Talk to you soon. Thank you, Jason.